I'd like to welcome everybody to the opening session of the third annual World Series of ETFs and Investment Management. Our session today is entitled Creating a Portfolio and Investment Strategy Consistent for Today's Volatile Market. My name is Elliot Herman and I will be your moderator. I am a partner at PRW Wealth Management. We are located down in Quincy, an advisory firm, and we try to uh, provide clarity for the present and uh, some vision in this, this murky future of ours. Uh, we're excited to have uh, voices from the trenches here with us today to share insights into their firm's approaches to investment management post-2008. I think we can all agree that since 2008, the world has, has changed, and there's been an, an enormous amount of impact on market psyche, and it truly needs to be seen today, I think, uh, in, in a different light. For proof, just look at the inflows into bond funds the first part of this year, despite a large run-up in the equity markets. I know when I started my career, uh, one of my early clients uh, in her 70s had said to me she wanted nothing to do with that gambling thing. Um, she was referring, of course, to that stock market, and at times it's really felt that way. Uh, whether we're waiting to see what happens in Slovakia last year, whether they'll vote on the Greek bailout, or this year we'll wait to see what happens in the elections in France, and we all know how that's uh, turned out and, uh, and will be playing out over the course of, uh, of this month and, and going forward. Uh, so, so what are some of the things that have really changed? What are shaping uh, the world today? Well, market reactions are faster, more intense, and oftentimes very contradictory. This causes many to question investment, uh, time-tested investment theories. High-speed trading has had an enormous impact on how investments are made. We saw in 2010 the negative consequences of a quantitative model that can cause an 1,100-point drop in the Dow in, in just a matter of minutes. Fiscal policy is certainly shaping events near term with unknown consequences long term. Uh, I'd like to refer to it as, as former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld's known unknowns and, and unknown unknowns, uh, and that's the world in which we're living. Tax policy, of course, is in flux. Do we sell now and, and pay a lower tax? Do we start to put dividend paying stocks into our uh, tax deferred plans uh, and, and out of taxable accounts. The, the landscape is, is, uh, is ever changing and will remain murky, uh, certainly until after the election. Changing demographics. We know baby boomers are retiring. Unemployment around the world, uh, especially among the young, is uh, growing at a very, very fast rate, and, and that's a scary proposition. Underfunded liabilities, be they pension, Social Security, health care, they threaten our safety nets. The increase in natural disasters, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, they take lives, they create enormous production shortages, and they fuel yet another issue, uh, global warming. Political polarization in Washington, enormous debt burdens, sovereign debt downgrades, inflation, austerity, terror, you, you name it, uh, the, the issues uh, are, are all out there and we, they're all facing and dealing with them every day. So what should be our expectations for the future? Are the headwinds this time around really that much greater than they have been in the past? There's certainly a lot of product out there, more so than, than has ever been out there before. So how do we know which ones truly make sense and which will be seen as passing fads? Is it true the more things change, the more things really stay the same? How much diversification is enough? How much is too much? How do we guard against misinterpreting the data and making a mistake if we choose to be tactical? We can all hand a volatility to the upside, but a poor on the downside. What happens when markets go on extended winning streaks and we are over, over diversified and perhaps missing out on some of the, uh, the, the market returns? How do we maintain our investors, how do we help our, main, our investors maintain the investment discipline needed to give us the best possibility for success? For us, it's always been about asking clients questions up front, designing goal-based portfolios, and communicating regularly. Ultimately, we, can, we realize we can control the markets, but we can but we can only try to control, we can't control the markets, but we can only try to control our emotions. Clients look to us for leadership and advice, so without further ado, let me introduce our four panelists. Chris Boyd is the founder of Asset Management Resources and its chief investment officer. He's been assisting clients on the Cape for over a decade. Chris is a graduate of Holy Cross and an experienced speaker. He teaches at several places on the Cape and also hosts a radio show entitled Something More with Chris Boyd. The show addresses a variety of financial issues from investment and tax planning to insurance and more. Greg Peterson. Greg is a managing director and senior investment advisor at Ballantin Partners. As a director of investment research, 
Chris is responsible for the firm's macroeconomic strategy, asset allocation, and quantitative research. Prior to joining the firm in 2002, Greg worked at Panagora Asset Management as a research manager. He began his investment career as a quantitative investment professional at Grantham, Mayo, and Van Otterloo. Prior to entering the financial services industry, Greg was an assistant professor of mathematics at East Carolina after, being, after having been a visiting assistant professor of mathematics at Duke University. Greg earned an MBA with a concentration in financial engineering from the Sloan School of Management at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's a regular contributor to the national media as well. Raj Sharma. Raj is managing director of investments and head of the Sharma Group of Merrill Lynch Private Banking and Investment Group with over two decades of experience in financial planning and asset management. He holds a master's degree in business management with specialization in finance from the Institute of Management Studies, Osmania University, India, and a master's degree in mass communications from Emerson College, Boston. Within Merrill Lynch Private Banking, Raj is a member of this company's highest recognition club, the Club of Circle of Champions. For eight consecutive years, he's been recognized by Marins as one of America's top 100 advisors, and in 2009, 10, and 11, he was recognized by Barron's as the number one advisor in Massachusetts. Richard Saperstein. Rich is over, has over 30 years of experience on Wall Street and is managing director, principal, and senior portfolio manager with Treasury Partners. He is widely acknowledged for his investment experience and since 2004 has ranked in the top tier of Barron's annual survey of America's top financial advisors. Mr. Saperstein has also been profiled in the Winner Circle, Wealth Management Insights from America's Best Financial Advisors, and is a regular contributor to the media. At this time, I'd like each of our panelists to describe uh, a bit about their practice uh, with a focus on the types of clients that they're working with, the size, and any specialties that they have. After that, we have some questions we'll ask, and then we're going to open it up for a Q&A. So, uh, Greg, would you like to start? Certainly. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Ballantyne Partners is a boutique wealth management firm uh, focusing on ultra-high net worth individuals. We are uh, a firm of 50 people. 20 of us are senior uh, client-facing uh, employees. The senior members uh, have a range of degrees, uh, being, ranging from C, uh, CPAs, CFAs, CLU, MBAs, uh, and, of course, me with a PhD in a subject which I rarely talk about with my clients. No one wants to talk about differential equations. <laughs> Um, but with this breadth of uh, clientele, uh, sorry, of uh, employees, we, are, we allow uh, a certain amount of specialization so that although we are generalists and need to know everything, uh, be familiar with everything, we have specialists in taxation, be it in asset allocation, in manager research. Um, we have uh, 100 clients, 100 families. The typical net worth is between 40 and $150 million. And uh, altogether, we are uh, advising on six and a half billion dollars worth of assets. We practice holistic wealth management, which is both uh, complex trusts, uh, estate planning, transition issues, and uh, portfolio management pure, purely on the investment side. On the investment side, we have 12 individuals who are performing research in different asset classes. Uh, macroeconomics, manager research, and we craft uh, broadly defined endowment style portfolios for taxable investors, uh, namely our clients. Thank you, Greg. Chris? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Chris Boyd. Um, I guess I'm probably at the other end of the spectrum from Greg. Uh, um, our typical, cl I, I actually, let me tell you about myself. I, uh, I started in broker-dealer world, um, was with an independent broker-dealer for about uh, 13 years or so before um, starting my own RIA in 2008. Um, who knew, right, you know? Uh, in any case, it turns out that um, our, our clients are a lot different from the look of Greg's clients. Um, we're typically dealing with clients who are um, retirees, um, you know, maybe settled on Cape Cod, and have, uh, you know, uh, portfolios of, you know, half a million dollars or so, maybe a little bigger, a little smaller, you know, that kind of a range. Um, so we're primarily trying to help them uh, protect what they have and generate some cash flow in their retirement. Um, 
we're, you know, uh, we're structured as a fee-based uh, asset management kind of a structure, though we do financial planning as usually our, you know, introductory kind of um, relationship, uh, which ultimately tends to lead to uh, portfolio management or investment advice. Uh, our firm, you know, when I started, we had maybe $28 million in assets under management, so pretty small. Uh, at the same time, um, we've grown to about $42 million, uh, for what is my assets in, in the meantime. And, and I've taken on a couple of other advisors, one, one of whom brought assets with them. So our firm is now, you know, maybe around $58 million in assets under management. Um, what's characteristically maybe different from me from some of these guys is over this period of time, I've gone from having more of an experience in dealing with third-party money managers as uh, the provider of service to our clients to taking more of that on in-house. And, um, you know, that may be, uh, you know, having had so much outsourced. When I started, I had probably about $20 million of our assets were uh, at third-party money managers, so and, and that's really significantly changed over the past few years. Um, anyway, that's probably a good introductory. I'll tell you more, I'm sure. Thank you, Chris. Rich? Uh, Rich Saperstein. Uh, my firm is Treasury Partners. We're located in New York, 17 people. Uh, we have discretion on $6 billion, and our clients really form in, fall into two categories. Uh, high net worth individuals and endowments, as well as corporations. We do two things. We outsource to uh, money managers around the world, as well as manage portfolios internally, primarily on the fixed income side. The team is broken up into uh, investment advisory, where there's a portfolio management team. Uh, we're on the line in terms of research, portfolio management, as well as uh, client service and operations. Thank you. Raj? Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. You know, Rick is very modest here. He's quite a, in addition to being an advisor, he's quite an entrepreneur and, uh, and you know, somebody we admire a lot in our profession. Um, I run a, you know, good old-fashioned private wealth management team. Uh, it's a boutique within a large company, Merrill Lynch. Uh, I've been at Merrill Lynch for uh, 25 years. Uh, and we are a team of 10 individuals, and the firm gives us the ability to be entrepreneurial, uh, to do our own thing, and to build our business and sort of fine-tune our investment philosophy and implement it the way we see fit. And uh, our business is uh, with a select number of families. Uh, we deal with roughly about 90 families around the country. Uh, about 10 to 15 percent of the business is with uh, foundations and endowments. And it's an outsourced family office model where we try to really understand a client's situation from a very comprehensive point of view, from personal business planning to philanthropic strategy to tax strategy and to very proactive asset management. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to start with an open question, and that is, how do you build portfolios today in post-2008 era? What has changed, perhaps, from the way that you used to do it, and, and how do you measure your success? Greg? Well, I'd say um, a decade ago, we did a lot of modern portfolio theory, mean variance optimization, where you had expected returns and risks. Uh, I think the tech bubble back in the early 2000s and its, and its implosion began uh, the process of uh, questioning modern portfolio theory in 2008 uh, essentially put the nail in the coffin. Uh, these are not, it was just clear that modern portfolio theory is un un unable to manage through that kind of a situation. Uh, what has emerged, I think, in the industry in general right now is that we are in a period of time of, uh, of a paradigm shift where the uh, solution that will replace modern or not replace, but, you know, have modern portfolio theory as a special case has yet to emerge. And so what we are confronted with right now is a plethora of new types of investment vehicles all claiming to be the next solution. Um, none of the, and, and that's essentially the, the problem that we are faced with now is to go through and try and figure out which of them have validity and which do not. Uh, it's an uncomfortable time period to have not have a dominant paradigm, something that we can, you can fall back on and say this is the solution. 
and it, if anything, it raises the bar for all of us to uh, consider different unique solutions and whether they make sense for our clients. Um, well, as I uh, mentioned before, you know, we kind of went through a change where I had outsourced a lot of our uh, work to a third-party money manager, and they had basically a strategic asset allocation, you know, with very modest tactical changes um, that uh, they employed uh, prior to 2008 that was what we were using. And um, as, as 2008 evolved, you know, we came into a time when, uh, and I just started this, I'd kind of started designing my own uh, portfolios using mutual funds and ETFs. And, um, you know, as, it, as, as the year went on, as September, November, uh, September, October, clients clearly knew they wanted to have less exposure to, um, to, their, to the various asset classes that were declining. And the structure we were using was not very responsive to that. It was definitely a buy and hold, you know, kind of a mindset. I was listening to CNBC on my way in today and, you know, hearing Warren Buffett talking about 10 years out and everything. And I'm sure that, you know, he's right in many respects that if I can sit tight and buy those good companies and hang on to them, things will all work out. But when I'm dealing with retirees who are looking at their, you know, retirement savings, you know, dissipate, they're getting to a point where they they want more uh, active uh, response in in severe declines, right? So, um, what we ended up doing is taking on more of that portfolio in house, and of course, at the same time, you know, as a business person, I had recognized that I was giving up about a third of my fee uh, to uh, another party that I really could benefit by having that in house. So. You know, we, we decided that, okay, it was going to make more sense for me to structure these portfolios, maybe with a similar kind of an asset allocation objective for strategic, but being willing to be more tactical. My problem was uh, I didn't have, at that time, any kind of a methodology to try to evaluate trends or identify when was the time to get out, when was the time to get in. So um, I went about looking for that in the, in the year or so that followed uh, the, the severe declines, you know, we, we looked uh, to finding, you know, I, I think we're at a time where advisors need to learn some new languages. You know, it's like, um, you know, learning to speak French instead of uh, English, you know. Um, trying to learn, you know, I, I kind of grew up in the, in the, I never had any formal securities training. It was more, you know, learn from a wholesaler than use Morningstar uh, uh, type of uh, resources to try to identify good money managers and so forth. Ultimately, I think, you know, we're getting to a point where fundamentals are a good long-term approach, but there may be times when we need to be more uh, paying attention to uh, trends or, you know, learn how to look at a chart and things like that. So um, that's what we went about trying to do over this period of time was find some alternative ways to be paying attention to indicators that could help us identify when it might be more appropriate to get in or get out or to, to at least on the edges get a little bit more defensive or get a little bit more opportunistic. Um, I, I look to um, the point and figure charting as a way to help me in that process. It's not a particularly fast moving charting kind of system, but um, it's helpful in trying to identify asset class strength and just look to uh, some momentum in the process. So, you know, I think that's probably one of the lessons that I've gotten out of this is that um, my clients expect us to be a little bit more proactive, and we're looking to do that by, uh, you know, being more attentive to trends, things like that. 2008 was a uh, landmark year uh, for those of us in the investment business, but uh, my thinking has been shaped over 30 years of uh, I'll call it the school of hard knocks. And we have to look back and remember, in the early 80s, we had the oil crisis. In 87, we had the uh, what I thought was the first crash. Uh, in the early 90s, we had the SNL crisis. In 98, we had long-term capital management, an Asian crisis. We had the tech crisis in our early 2000s. And then in 08, we had the uh, real financial crisis. And for everyone in this room, we have to have our thinking conditioned and shaped based on all of those events, not just 2008. 
2008 really focused on two new and very dangerous risks. One is liquidity or the lack of, and the second one is heightened correlations among asset classes. Previously, in all those other events, we really didn't experience the tremendous, tremendous volatility and risk of those two uh, problems, illiquidity and correlation. In terms of uh, illiquidity and how we're addressing it today, uh, it's very important when we construct the portfolio to make sure that we have protection against illiquidity regardless of the lack of return on those assets. Meaning, in today's environment, there's a great trend towards moving fixed income into, let's say, dividend-paying stocks. Well, that might be a, a great solution to increase return, but in today's environment, it may change the risk profile of a portfolio. And we don't know what the price of liquidity will be in making that adjustment. In terms of correlations, in 08, we, well, prior to 08, and I think uh, Modern Portfolio Theory's uh, nail was put on the coffin. I don't know if I agree with that 100%, but I think I'll agree that uh, we previously were diversifying asset classes to reduce overall portfolio risk. And then in 08, we found that we had ultimate correlations amongst these previously not, these diversified asset classes. So basically, everything went down. Great example of that was high yield, which was previously looked at as a bond investment. We immediately discovered it was it had a correlation of 0.7 to the market. So for every 1% downside of the S&P, we had 7 tenths of 1% downside in high yield. So we got a rude lesson on asset class correlations in 08 that we really didn't have in all those prior experiences. So following that, we had to change our stripes again and visit what is the real correlation in a hostile environment of different asset classes. So going forward, one of the things that we do is we build portfolios and really drill down on what's the correlation of different asset classes in these devastating environments. So the net effect of this is generally a more conservative portfolio, lower return attributions, but increased liquidity and lower correlation in downside markets. You know, I agree with you know what the all the other speakers are saying about the environment changing. <coughs> um, you know, what we do in our group, and just like uh, all the advisors here, it's sort of driven by our clients. And our clients are, you know, in the ultra high net worth segment, you know, over $10 million of assets. And they're interested in sort of four things. Number one, wealth preservation. <laughs> they don't want to be poor again. They've made their money, and that's a big challenge for us. <clears throat> Number two, they're interested in absolute return, not relative return and they expect us to be magicians. Number three, they want to understand the risk of what they have, the risk of the various components of the portfolio. And number four is expectations <clears throat> and anchoring expectations. You know, what can you expect from a certain asset class over time? So over time, our approach has shifted quite a bit from pure asset allocation to risk allocation. And I sort of look at the world in, in you know, four buckets, and, and in, many of this is sort of driven by my clients who tend to have a concentration in private equity, in hedge funds, or a public company, and that's where they've made their wealth, uh, and that's what they see as sort of the home run bucket, if I can <coughs> talk about it that way. On the other side of the barbell are a mix of safe assets where their principal is protected even if the rate of return is low. You know, as Rick was mentioning, things like municipal bonds where returns have fallen, but still it's a very legitimate asset class as long as you understand the expectations. So in between the two barbells of, say, aggressive and very safe, 
We have sort of come up with two other buckets, and I'm sure all of you call it by sort of various uh, names or uh, you know designations. We call a bucket fixed income proxy, where you have a variety of things here which generate income. It could be dividend income funds, it could be high yield bonds, it could be municipal bonds, it could be MBS portfolios, it could be emerging market debt, things where you're basically milking a yield out of it. You know, it could be four, five, or six percent. And then you have the market risk component, which that's what gives us all the angst. Uh, you know, being leveraged to the global marketplace, being leveraged to equities. Today we are hearing with all the upheaval over the weekend, you know, I think there's going to be a fair amount of turmoil in the markets today. So, and around, around this kind of allocation are two sort of premises which, uh, you know, we strongly believe in. Number one, we are turning away from a U.S.-centric world to much more of a global world. And I think we all need to be global investors to preserve our clients' capital. The second thing is the risk equation has changed substantially. No longer is the United States the gilt-edged AAA credit, and no longer is Brazil, you know, the you know the speculative credit. I use Brazil as an as an example, but essentially, if you look at what's happening with ratings and liquidity. The world has gotten divided into creditor countries and debtor countries, and that equation is something to watch out for. And I think how we make money longer term will be based on that, that kind of understanding as opposed to the traditional metrics of risk. Uh, hey, thank you, Raj. There seems to be an increasing movement towards the use of passive ETFs. As well as, as well as active ETFs over active mutual fund strategies. ETFs continue to see rapid growth, as indicated in a recent report from McKinsey & Company. Based on their calculations, assets under management for ETFs grew by a staggering 30% per year over the 2000 to 2010 period. This compares to 5.6% growth reflected for mutual funds over the same time period. While $1.5 trillion is held in ETFs, this comprises only 10% of all mutual fund assets, so ETFs still have a long way to go in order to catch mutual funds. Nonetheless, the growth trend in ETFs is expected to continue, with McKinsey estimating the total to reach between $3.1 trillion and $4.7 trillion over the next five years. Interestingly, a key part of this trend will likely be the continued interest in active managed ETFs. So my question to the panel is, do you use ETFs in your practice? If so, how do you use them? How micro do you get? Do you look very industry-specific, industry country ETFs? How, how much do you slice and dice? Do you use them to hedge, or do you use, use the hedge fund like ETFs? Are there other types of investments you seek to avoid, such as leverage ETFs, or do you like e leverage ETFs? If you do not use ETFs, why not? Uh, we were early adopters of ETFs. We began using them uh, extensively in our practice back in 2002. Uh, we like the low cost, the low fee, the tax efficiency of them. Uh, they give excellent beta exposure to the global equity markets. Uh, since 2002, they have, there's been an explosion, as we all know, um, into various other avenues, ranging from fixed income ETFs to uh, hedge fund replicator ETFs. Uh, we manage uh, around and search through all those ideas, but as the ETF structure moves away from its traditional core equity only piece, the efficiencies and benefits are not as clear. Uh, there have been some uh, very amazing uh, failures in the ETF space where futures were put in place. So you have to be very careful when you start looking at new products in that area. So we still are very, uh, still believe in the ETF structure. I mean, it is the returns are what you get to, our clients get to keep after tax, after fees. Uh, we do round out the portfolios for um, our clients with hedge funds, private equity, timber, and commodities, and we continue to look at uh, what is available in those areas uh, in the exchange-traded uh, place, but we also use a lot of private placements. Um, my clients, as I say, are a little smaller, so um, we don't have the option to use private placements and things of that sort. So, you know, ETFs are a great tool for getting access to lots of different uh, asset classes. Um, you know, we still we have portfolios that are mutual fund designed, and we have portfolios that are ETF 
oriented. I, I envision that for us it's going to continue to take on more and more emphasis where uh, at the advisor level we'll do more to be uh, directing and selecting where we want the emphasis to be placed. Um, we use both uh, in some portfolios, you know, broad-based ETFs, uh, you know, to get broad access to various markets, and in other designs we're using it to complement or emphasize sectors or, you know, individual com countries, things like that. So um, we're kind of using it in, bo in, in both of these possible range of, uh, of designs, um, particularly uh, in the portfolios that we use ETFs, uh, we kind of have a blended approach where we've got a more strategic component, which is you know these low cost and all the all the attributes that uh, Greg was talking about that are so great about ETFs. And then we also have uh, pair that up with maybe a less tax efficient approach, but with you know some more turnover and and more sector rotation kinds of uh, ideas, things like that that are going on. So um, hopefully that offers my two cents. Uh, we use ETFs, and uh, my statement on that would be the, the elegance of ETFs lies in its simplicity, meaning uh, we don't use inverse ETFs, turbo ETFs, or anything over very complicated or risky. Again, the elegance lies in its simplicity. In 08, remember the risks of ETNs and the sponsor of the ETNs, where we took the credit risk of some of those sponsors. It's another area we try to stay very careful with as to who the issuer is of the ETN. In terms of how we use ETFs, uh, uh, we run two strategies. One is a S&P-based equity strategy, and the other is a fixed income strategy. Uh, the S&P-based equity strategy is simply a core satellite structure, and the satellites really emphasize various asset classes or industry groups relative to what we think is best compared to the S&P. The fixed income strategy enables us to uh, capture bond asset classes that we internally do not have the ability to run the money in. This could be MBS, ABS, uh, loan flows, uh, preferred funds, or any type of fixed income or fixed income-like asset class where we need to build large infrastructure to invest in those different vehicles. Uh, the, the other area where we use ETFs is to gain laser or rifle shot exposure to a specific industry group or asset class or sector. So for example, if we're favorable on uh, China or certain BRIC countries or anything where we want to have a very laser uh, investment within a client's portfolio, we could simply and elegantly capture that exposure through the ETF. You know, I think ETFs are, in my mind, the, the biggest disruptive force we have seen in the investment landscape in several decades. It's like, the, it's like Amazon to Barnes & Noble, and I think people haven't quite realized it, especially when you come up with actively managed ETFs. Um, so I think the implications to uh, investors are you know, very positive. For the consumer, I think there will be tremendous fee compression possibly fee compression for the advisor. You've got to justify your fees. And, uh, but I think it's going to change the landscape like, uh, you know, like uh, nobody anticipated. And I think the, it's incumbent on advisors to really learn how to use them effectively. You know, as you know, PIMCO has come up with the total return ETF, which I think last week or the past few weeks has collected something like $2.5 billion. Uh, and I think the uh, the same ETF, the mutual fund, the expense ratio, there's a difference of like 20 or 25 basis points. And it's the same product. And um, so I think um, the era of actively managed ETFs, which basically means you can get the same mutual fund strategies and ETFs with, with liquidity during the day, I think is an exciting development. And as far as I'm concerned, we are sort of agnostic to the vehicle. 
we want to make sure we use the best vehicle for our clients. So we, we still use a lot of SMAs for fixed income. You know, there's predictability, there's uh, mature, you know, definition, there's permanence to it. We use SMAs for tax efficiency. Uh, I know ETFs are also tax efficient. I'm still sort of trying to understand how, you know, how they make it so tax efficient. Um, ETFs have some limitations, the passive ones, but if you are talking about active ETFs, which are unconstrained, which can go anywhere, I think uh, that opens up an entirely new uh, sort of frontier for us. So at the present time, um, and again, we are open to ideas, we use ETFs in two ways. One is sort of tactical plays. You know, tactical has become the new proactive management, the new buzzword. And it's interesting, you, you call a client about a tactical strategy, people think you're on top of the game. And I, and I think it is sort of risky, you know, trying to call a market time, you know, try to uh, call a trend in a particular sector. But, but believe it or not, you know, we live in an era of CNBC and immediate news, and I think we need to sort of respond to what our clients are looking for. So in terms of tactical plays, we look at tactical plays as anything under, say, 24 months. You know, this could be in energy or precious metals or agricultural commodities or currencies. You know, China opening up their currency. What could it mean to, you know, emerging market currencies? Could it mean to Asian currencies? You could play that through an ETF effectively. So use a variety of ETFs for that. We also use ETFs, uh, as Rick had mentioned, sort of for niche uh, plays, more longer-term plays to get a specific country exposure. Everybody is talking about the BRIC countries, but the exciting story may be beyond the big BRIC countries. And the problem with many of the large uh, you know, uh, ETFs which target emerging markets is you know, they have a big concentration in developed markets and they don't have concentration in the newly emerging markets like you know, Indonesia, or Vietnam, and places like that. And that's where I think ETFs can give you that targeted exposure. I like the emerging market consumer as a theme, and I know there are ETFs targeting the emerging market consumer, which is a very durable theme. If you look at emerging markets last year, they were down, but the emerging market consumer ETF was actually up or flat, uh, so it outperformed in a major way because that is a real major theme. Emerging market infrastructure is an, another interesting area. I like ETFs which target emerging markets income. You know, it's interesting that dividend income in emerging markets, even power companies there pay a 7 to 8% uh, dividend with uh, growth rates, EPS growth rates of 10 to 15%. Power companies are growth companies in emerging markets, and those are you know, essential utilities, and so ETFs which can capture that because the actively managed area hasn't quite developed products to tap into emerging markets in an active way. So, you know, I see this as a, an exciting area uh, and it's something that's going to be a learning process, you know, for advisors uh, over the next many years. But I do see this changing the landscape in a fairly dramatic fashion. All right, thank you. I have a couple more questions, but I'd like to open it up uh, in the interest of time to any questions out there in the audience. Anybody? Approaching the ETF market, kind of a buyer beware mentality. When I design a portfolio for a client and I want a certain asset class or a subclass and I find an ETF that has that, I uh, research it further. As opposed to new ETFs coming out, how can I fit them into the portfolio rather than the opposite? Any thoughts on that? Does that question make any sense? Uh, yeah, it's very so similar to the way we approach the ETF markets. Uh, we look, we, we're looking from a broad asset allocation perspective and then figuring out what the, what the access points are and whether there's an ETF uh, that fits uh, the client's portfolio. Uh, that being said, we have some younger investment analysts who like to play in their 401ks with uh, triple inverse natural gas. <laughs> you know, if you, if you peel the cover off an ETF, you know, it is basically a, a portfolio. It's a model. And, and I think, uh, you, know, with, you know, with passive ETFs, you've got all kinds of indices they can follow. With actively managed ETFs, you want to look at the underlying fund, whether it's a mutual fund or ETF. 
And, uh, you know, the whole area of these leveraged ETFs and low volatility ETFs are sort of a new game. I mean, I don't think it's like, a, you know, weapons of mass destruction. Nobody knows when it's going to blow up. And we, we you know, we, we haven't stress tested enough. Um, so, you know, that's what I would look at. I would look at the underlying model uh, and see if it makes sense, uh, you know, for your clients. Would you do that if it's a mutual fund or if it's an SMA? I guess uh, directed to Rick, you had mentioned uh, two uh, lessons, I guess, learned from the crash was the illiquidity of the market and the uh, asset class correlation that we witnessed. And now you're expressed in your portfolios, you're using many, uh, I guess, some new ideas for non-correlated assets. Uh, could you give us some examples of what they are and uh, are you using any ETFs um, for that allocation? It's a good question. Um, I think it's important to uh, look at portfolios, uh, and, and Raj had the greatest way to look at it. Uh, instead of asset allocation, risk allocation, which uh, I always learn a new thing every, every day. I say, I'm with Raj. Um, and, and the key to risk allocation is ultimately uh, finding investments that have low correlations to what we look at it very simply the S&P. And those might include various types of alternative strategies. So uh, we bucket them in two categories. One is multi-strategy hedge funds, and then the other one is single-strategy hedge funds. The uh, multis, we typically look to achieve lower but more consistent returns with low correlation to the market. So. Some of the multis will have, and again, this is over anywhere from 7 to 25-year track records, correlations around a 0 0.1, 0 0.2 versus the market. So what does that mean? That means so if the market goes in any one direction by 10%, they might move in a correlated fashion of just 1 or 2%. So what we're trying to do is uh, inject those into a portfolio to deliver some more consistent returns, but very low correlation to the S&P. The second category would be what I'll call our tactical hedge fund exposure. And here we're looking at very individualized strategies designed to achieve certain type of uh, performance or uh, type of return within a portfolio. So this could be uh, long, short equity in the most traditional sense. Uh, it could be a distressed credit fund. Uh, it could be a macro fund or something where the manager is adding value to the portfolio. And again, we want to see a low correlation to the market because we don't want, you know, the, the hedge funds have three issues. They're illiquid, they're not transparent, and they're very expensive. So in order to, for us to uh, accept those conditions, we want favorable returns but low market correlation. We don't use any other vehicles to achieve low market correlation plus returns. It's only that space. Yes, sir. We have time for one more question. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious about, you know, anyone with a global type of uh, portfolio, how do you allocate that globally? You know, U.S., international, whatever you're, you know, you know, whatever you're allocating it to, and how often do you change that allocation? And what, what prompts you to change that allocation? Because it seems to me that, you know, there are two things involved here. One is uh, the right securities, let's say, we're using, I'm talking ETFs now, and the other is allocating those securities. So if, if you could, you know, talk about that, I'd appreciate it. You know, I can take a shot at it. You know, one, uh, you know, that's always a challenge, you know, uh, how do you actively allocate, how do you actively rebalance, especially in a world where, you know, things are changing so rapidly. I'm a big fan of unconstrained funds. Um, you know, targeting the global area. You know, these funds have the ability to 
go from you know one market to the other uh, fairly rapidly. They can also allocate between equities and fixed income. And and I think you're giving the manager a tremendous amount of leeway to uh, you know to make the right kind of allocation decisions. So uh, I don't pretend to be an expert in every single asset class, every single country. So that has been a you know a pretty good vehicle for us. Uh, I'd say we are um, fairly extreme in how we uh, create our client asset allocations in that uh, for the last uh, year we have been allocating zero, and I repeat zero, to traditional EFA investments. Um, we're looking for highest and best use of money, and if we have a concern about a large region, in this case the euro area, um, we're going to put zero there against the fact that, you know, traditional portfolio management and theory and says, you know, you're, I'm really market timing to that sector. Um, well, I look at it this way. I wouldn't put my own money in, in that sector right near versus others, and I'm not going to put client money there now. So um, we've had zero allocation to that traditional EFA investing area. On the other hand, um, how are we getting our international exposure? Well, we're getting it now through uh, very targeted um, investments in the emerging area. So one of our themes is uh, you have a shrinking West with high debt burdens, poor fiscal condition, and you have an emerging East where you have population growth, you have sound fiscal policies, and low general debt burdens. So uh, we think that if you look at globally East versus West, there's great value ultimately in the long term in, in investing in the East. But rather than taking a broad-based uh, shot against EFA, we want to take it selectively to uh, very targeted emerging economies. Uh, my final point on international investing is that uh, it causes us to make two decisions to be correct whenever we invest outside the states because most of our clients are dollar-based investors and their payables, their their rent, they well. They don't, most of our clients pay their expenses, their kids' college tuition, in dollars. So ultimately, when we invest outside the USA, we're, we've got to be right on two decisions. One is that local currency versus the dollar, and two, on that investment. And 